bow our heads and we say a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the day and the opportunity to gather with our brothers and sisters by your spirit, by your word. Open our hearts to understand who you are and what you have come to do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My brothers, my sisters, we have a Christmas tradition in our family that annoys my wife to no end. Uh, those are the best ones. Yeah. <laughs> so when you're opening your Christmas gifts, you always, you know, you, you wad up your 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 uh, the wrapping paper, right? I think I've shared this with you before, right? And when someone's not looking, you pelt them with it. That's what we do. And that's one thing that annoys my wife. But what, what the other tradition is, is you leave it for like a day, right? And the house is just a disaster. It's absolutely ridiculous. But it makes December 26th one of my favorite days. I wake up in the morning, and I usually have nothing to eat. And the house is a disaster. But there's this wonderful feeling because we've just had a great couple of days with your family. And there's food everywhere. And there's no plan for anything. And it's just a wonderful, peaceful, messy day. <laughs> Add to it, it's also a one of my children's birthday. But it's just a nice day. Christmas has a way of kind of creating peace and harmony even in the midst of chaos, right? Uh, family members who don't always get along find a way to sit at the same table and enjoy Christmas together. Siblings who are at each other all year long suddenly find it in themselves to give that sibling that's picking on them constantly a gift. It has a way of creating peace and harmony and joy even when a lot of times there isn't. There's a famous story, I can't remember if it's World War I or World War II, where the two sides are shooting at each other, and they agree that on Christmas Day they're going to what? Stop! Uh, that's it. Christmas creates peace. Christmas puts an end to war. Christmas puts an end to battle. He would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, what? One of the things he would come to do would become would come to bring peace on earth, goodwill to men. That's what the angel said, right? And he did that. He established, he created, he gave peace to mankind, peace between each other, because we're able to forgive each other and move on. Peace even more between us and God, because he would come to take away the sins of the world, and God now loves us, smiles on us, values us, calls us his children. Through faith in Christ Jesus, there is peace between me and God. And that peace that we have with God, to know that God has established peace with me, that he doesn't hold anything against me, that he will always take care of me, he will always watch over me, he will always love me, creates in our lives something that nothing else can there, there is a confidence that comes from it. That I know that whatever whatever comes tomorrow, whatever I may face, whatever obstacles there may be, I am at peace because I know that God cares what I can face it. There's a joy that even on the worst day, I know that my God loves me and I can find a reason to rejoice. That my troubles then become a reason for me to celebrate because I know that God is going to take even that and make it work out for good. There's a patience that comes with it. I don't have anything to prove to anyone. I don't have to accomplish anything. I don't have to, have to, have to anything because I know that I am at peace with God and there's a contentment that comes from that. But if we think that the peace that comes from God is going to mean that everything in your life is wonderful and that there will be no war and that there will be no battle 
and that there will be no adversity you don't understand the world that you live in. Even the very first Christmas, yes, he would be the Prince of Peace. He was born in Bethlehem to bring peace on earth, goodwill to men. But in that first Christmas, Herod hears about this one who is coming to bring peace, and Herod says, what? Oh, no, no, no. This can't be. And what does he do? The birth of the Prince of Peace leads to the slaughter of the innocents, the killing of all, of all the babies in Bethlehem. Jesus, his whole ministry, what did he preach? What did he tell people? He wants them to love each other. He wants them to forgive each other. He wants them to understand each other. All he did was bring peace. Peace between Jews and Gentiles. Peace between those who hated the Romans and those who loved the Romans. Peace. Understanding, patience, kindness. This is what he taught. And how did they treat him? They wanted him dead. Yeah. From the very beginning. As soon as he started to preach. They would torture him, and they would have a mock trial, and they would kill him. In the bulletin, there's, there's Jesus is talking. This is the Prince of Peace. And this is the reality. And it helps us understand the world that we live in, and it helps us understand the peace that we have. This is what Jesus said. Page 9, top of page nine. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the murderers of his members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their... Their olive branch... Not their dove, their cross. And follow me is not worthy. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. The message of the peace that God brings to you and me through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ causes conflict. The world doesn't like it because it isn't the way that the world works. From the very beginning, from the birth of the Prince of Peace, all through the ministry of the Prince of Peace, there was conflict, there was opposition. And we should not expect in our lives that it should be any different than that. I remember, I remember counseling a couple, and she was a devout Christian, and he was not at all. He thought it was all nonsense. They're having some marriage trouble, and I sat down to counsel them. And, and he was talking to me about, they were constantly fighting, bickering about this, arguing about that, all these little things. And he sit, they're sitting there trying to figure out how to stop this conflict, how to stop all these fights and picking at each other. And he said, Pastor, the only way that this is going to work is if there are consequences for action. When somebody does something wrong, this is what the result needs to be. There needs to be consequences that are not so fun, not so great, so that people behave. Otherwise, she's just going to abuse me, and I'm going to abuse her, and there will never be peace unless there are threats and consequences. And I'm like, oh, wow. That's the way that the world works. The world creates peace through shows of strength, through shows of fear, through laws and rules and threats. And it establishes some sort of external... Uh, surface peace where at least people behave and don't hit each other. But it leaves deep down inside a war, an anger, an opposition that cannot go away by threats or fears. If the world doesn't like the message of the Prince of Peace and the peace that you and I live and the peace that you and I share because it is not the way that the world wants things to be, those who are miserable, those who are filled with fear, those who are filled with anger, they want you to be angry too. Those who are in authority want you to be, want to control you through fear and through threats and through laws. And when you and I have the peace of God in us, it, it, none of that can affect you and me because we know that who is the Lord of my life? Prince of peace, and I don't care what you say, I am at peace with 
thought. And so when I said to that husband, I said to him, I think a better solution would be for the two of you to learn how to forgive each other. He laughed in my face and threatened to kill me if I ever came and talked to his wife again. The world hates the message of forgiveness and the message of peace. It is opposed to it because it is not the way that they want the world to work. You and I should not sit here and feel sorry for ourselves and throw ourselves a pity party because the world says bad things about Christians and don't like us or don't, oh, I can't believe they would say that about us. It's so untrue. Jesus told us it was going to happen. Jesus says you follow the Prince of Peace, but understand that that's going to bring a sword, that that's going to bring opposition, that people aren't going to like you talking about peace and forgiveness and understanding and patience and unity. So as my mom would say, right, stop crying, stand up, pull up your big boy pants and deal with it. Unfortunately, in our lives when we face opposition from inside the church, from our own family, from outside the church, at work, wherever, we resort to the ways of the world. We use anger, we use threats, we use fear, and we use power to try and control and move and manipulate people. And that's not the way of peace. That's why Jesus came. He came to forgive us for the times that we haven't always dealt with each other in the way that God would have us deal with each other. But he reminds us today that he is the Prince of Peace. And we are the followers of the Prince of Peace. And the way that we deal with each other, the overriding thing that should characterize you and me and the way that we live is not fear, it's not anger, it's not threats, it's not my way or the highway, it's not stubbornness, it's not... But it is what? Understanding, patience, kindness, confidence. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we have forgotten that we follow the Prince of Peace. I'm going to read to you some verses from 1 John. It took me a long time to figure out what John was talking about. I never understood this. It always made me feel guilty. And after a while, I began to understand what John is saying here. Uh, okay. First John chapter 4. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who is perfect, the one who fears, is not made perfect in love. Perfect love drives out fear. Well, who's got perfect love? I, I think I do pretty good with my kids and my wife, but I guarantee that they'd be happy to tell you that it's not perfect. Who has perfect love? Jesus' perfect love drives out my God's perfect love for me brings me peace. Whatever conflicts there may be around me, whatever issues may come, whatever obstacles in my, are in my way, whatever threats there are, whatever difficulties I have, I know that I have a God who perfectly loves me, that I am perfectly at peace with him, and therefore there is nothing for me to fear, nothing for me to be anxious about, nothing for me to get myself all wound up about, to become defensive of, because I know that I have a perfect God who loves me. And I have peace with him. And there is no one who can take that away. Nothing that can affect that. So why do I let the threats of the, of the world, why do I let the ways of the world consume my mind and change the way that I view things? Perfect love. God's perfect love drives out fear. He is the Prince of Peace. And I walk the way of peace. 
what Christmas means. And that's why Christmas brings peace. Not because I got nothing to do on December 26th. Not because I get a couple of days off. Not because the story is so wonderful. It is, but that's not why. It is a peace that I have with God that surpasses all what? May you have a peaceful Christmas. Be ready for the story. But deal with it not in the ways of the world. Deal with it in the ways of the Prince of Peace. Deal with opposition as Christians, not in threats, not in fear, not in anger, but in peace. We respond to anger, to threats, with peace. For Jesus' sake. We continue with our next hymn, the first song.